Well, it's really great to be back here. We are getting back into the wonderful book of Ecclesiastes. Happens to be, it's been a great Sunday morning just getting to meet with a bunch of visitors that are here. And I just want to first off just say, this series happens once a month. (laughs) Um, We hope that you would come back. But I do think there's a lot of great stuff for us here. We're going to finish off chapter two this morning as we come to the book of Ecclesiastes. And I just want to at least put a disclaimer out. I think oftentimes the book of Ecclesiastes gets a really bad rep where we say this is just the book that is just full of despair and should bring us to a place of being depressed as we get to the book. But I also want to say that Ecclesiastes is equally a book of great joy because there's a great deal of wisdom here for us. And so rather than calling it a book of despair, I think it would be more right for us to call it a book that is just simply real, a realistic book for us. It's a book that we need. It's a book that the Lord himself has given to us, his people. Um, And so as we enter in, there will be a lot of things that are seemingly repeated from the previous months when we started this series. And I hope that, as I've said almost every month I've been up here, please do not tune out. The preacher, and we'll hear his words again in his search as we've been exploring with him, this is not just a philosophical journey for us. It is like a mirror before us to see the very life that we are living here under the sun for us to contemplate our own lives under the sun. And there's much wisdom to be found in these verses. So with that, I do invite you this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter two, verses 18 to 26. As you find your way there, would you please rise? Would you please stand if you're able for the reading of God's holy and errant and all sufficient word? I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity." There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As we get to the end of chapter two, we've been in chapter two for a while, and I just want to frame this as well. Really, all of chapter two and really the last parts of chapter one could really all go together as one. We've been with the preacher here, named Coleleth, kind of just translated the preacher. So when I reference the preacher, I'm not referencing myself here. I'm referencing the preacher here who is speaking to us. He is on this kind of expiration. If you remember back in chapter one, verse three, if there is any gain to be had under the sun, and he then goes on this expiration, a journey to figure out this answer. And he goes through various means. He seeks out wisdom, pleasure, wise living, and he comes to the same conclusion every time and the same conclusion that we reach here this morning. It's all vanity, right? The Hebrew word hevel, meaning vapor, breath. It's elusive. It doesn't last. 
There's nothing under the sun, as the preacher says, that can bring you lasting significance, satisfaction, or even security. Some of your translations might call that word meaningless. I don't think that's the better translation. I think translating as vanity and and the side of thinking about it as breath and vapor and the elusiveness of life under the sun is the better translation there. And we get to our favorite topic here in the States, our work. Our work. Once again, this is not a section that is meant to be read in the vacuum of things. If you remember, the preacher, when he was talking about his pleasures earlier on in this chapter, he talks about all that he has done. He cultivated his gardens, right? He's basically had these wonderful home projects that he put all his money into and still had money left over, was able to hire a bunch of people so he didn't have to do the work himself, and he made it beautiful. He had gardens, and then he had water for his gardens. He had it all, it was this majestic city almost in his own home, in his palace. And so when we're talking about work this morning, this is more than just talking about simply our vocations. This is talking more than just about our occupations. And so for our youth students and our younger students that are here, this is also for you. This is not just for the working class. This is talking about the amount of energy that is being spent on literally everything that we do under the sun. And he calls it toil. And he begins right off the bat here, just as he, if you remember from a month ago, he ended in verse 17 of this chapter that he hated life. He's very honest there about him hating life because he saw that, yes, there is this seemingly gain from wisdom, but at the end of the day, the wise man and the foolish man seem to end up in the same place. In other words, the preacher here in chapter two is bringing to light the expiration date that all of us will one day face. This may be the most uncomfortable topic for any of us to consider. Death. He doesn't just sugarcoat it. He doesn't just simply say this is just the way of life. It is something that brings him to that conclusion that he hates life. And even here this morning, He hates all his toil. Just think for a second again, if you're in one of our small groups or our life groups and you're meeting later tonight, how's your week been? I hate all the toil that I've been doing under the sun this week. I'm sure the elders might get a text later on that night saying, we need to pray for this family. (laughs) But here we see the preacher Last month, in verse 17, talking about him hating life as he sees the results of even living wisely. It seems like it ends in the same place. But now as he considers his work, he hates all the toil in which he toiled under the sun. This is his assessment. Now, one thing to get straight here is that the preacher is not hating work itself or labor That's kind of the way that we often think in the world today, though, that work is the problem. The amount of things we got to do is the problem, right? Every one of you have walked through these doors this morning, and I'm sure that there are a lot of things that are weighing on your mind that need to get done. Maybe this is a nice little rest period for you, and right after service ends, you've got to do things for your family, maybe you gotta continue house projects, you gotta keep doing things, and and there's things that are on your mind that are pressing right now that are bringing a great deal of anxiety and frustration and stress, and the list of words can go on. And the preacher's assessment here, when he says that he hates all his toil in which he toiled under the sun, he is not saying that work is the problem. Work is not the problem. It's not even inherently evil. 
And so when we see his assessment there, it should, it should actually bring us back, especially in this whole quest. I, I, I've said this before as we've been going through Ecclesiastes, that there is a lot of imagery that goes back to the opening chapters in Genesis. And as we see the assessment of the preacher here say that he hates toil, it brings us back almost to the beginning in Genesis again. Before the fall, before sin enters into the world, before shalom is broken, before things are no longer the way that they should be, there was work. Adam and Eve, as they are put in the garden, are called to work. And you know what? That work that God had called them to was not to keep them busy, was not to keep them mindless, but it was a gift. As they would be in that garden, bearing the image of the one who created them, and in their work, just as God would walk in the cool mornings of the garden, work was intimately tied to their relationship with their creator for their joy in him to his glory. Fast forward, that Eden is no longer a seemingly paradise. Just think about how you view work and the way that the preacher views work here. I've been using this term, the desolate Eden. Work is toil, and we see that as the curse in Genesis 3. Work no longer looks like a gift to us. What's lost in Eden is that now work begins our source for gain. We work so that we can be financially secure. We work so that we might have reputation, or recognition. We work as a means to an end to somehow get for ourselves a sort of sense of satisfaction, significance, and security. It is no longer a gift to us as we see it. It is met with great pain, toil, stress, anxiety, sorrow. This is the picture that the preacher is painting for us. There's this contrasted image here as we are reminded of those first chapters in Genesis. As we think about Adam and Eve in that garden before the fall, before sin entered into the world. That work was a beautiful thing that was a gift to Adam and Eve. But now work has become something that we use and try to utilize to even recover what was lost in the fall. We seek to use it as a source for our gain and profit. And the preacher here says, That's vanity. There's no gain in that. Now what's gonna be even interesting here as we get to the preacher's reasoning for why he hated his toil, this is an amazing thing for us to realize here. He's not going to just simply say that he works and then the results just don't show for it, right? Because that in itself is pretty frustrating. You put in all the work, all the hours, all the effort, and then what you expect doesn't come out of it. What's actually happening here is The preacher is going to work, put his mind to it, use wisdom, use knowledge, use his skills, and it's going to look like it is successful, and he will still come to the same conclusion that that is also vanity under the sun, for you to consider that as gain, because it will not last. This is why he hates his toil so much, and not because of work itself, because it's, it's what happens after. It's the result of when death comes, knocking at his door, he understands at the end of the day, all that he's done, all that he spent his time on, all that he spent his energy on, and effort upon, he goes on to say this, I must leave it to the man who will come after me. All of that hard work and time and energy simply left to another. 
I remember when I was younger, and I'm kind of exposing myself here. I was always fascinated when I was younger about talking about heaven with my parents and various other people in life. And for some reason, I had this notion that when Christ comes again and he brings us to heaven, that whatever I've got my hands grasping, I will take with me. And so there were moments I remember on the the dining table where I would fiercely grip onto things that are strange things to grip onto, like a chair. Like I was like thinking, I want to be comfortable in heaven. I'm going to take this chair with me. I'm glad I never told my parents because I think they would have brought me right here to Ecclesiastes. With your whole life, you grip on certain things under the sun. You spend your whole life chasing after for your significance, security, for satisfaction. And it's like a breath. It will not be like that chair that I fiercely gripped onto. It will, it will be ripped from your hands. Not only will it just be ripped from your hands, but it will be given to another. A loss of security and control. He goes on to say, what even makes this worse is not, not just that it will be ripped from your hands, that you can't just take it with you, that it won't be some sort of gain or advantage for you. But he goes on to say in verse 19 that, Who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? You don't even know who it will even go to after. You can write your will. You can do everything that you need to do. But at the end of the day, you do not know whether it will be left all that hard work and energy that you've spent on whatever you've done with all of your life, all of your life's hard work. You do not know who it will go to. Maybe the fool or the wise. This is troubling for the preacher here. You spend 30, 40 years chasing after something under the sun to fill you. And he goes on to the next guy who may be a fool in six months, everything you worked for is gone. No lasting meaning. I know this may be a great fear for a lot of our parents this morning. Your whole life dedicated to raising your children in the Lord. It's noble, noble work. What your kids do with that knowledge, I don't know. I'm not trying to bring us to a place of just simply being in the valley but there is a real sense in which the preacher is wanting us to face reality head on here. And I'll say this, as much as I am the one preaching this morning, I hope I'm not the only one that feels deeply troubled and uncomfortable with these truths. Because it's hard hitting, isn't it, this morning? We don't know whether the one that it will be left over to will be a fool or wise. There seems to be a loss of significance there. He talks about, yet this person, whether a wise man or a fool, will be the master for all of which he toiled, that he even used his wisdom under the sun. This is the truth of the matter, and the preacher comes to the conclusion, this also is vanity. The things that we do under the sun, trying to find gain under the sun with our work and the results that they produce here under the sun are simply temporary and they will come to an end is what the preacher is saying. He's saying begin with the end. Praise God he doesn't just leave us there. Simply say this is vanity, he goes even further. He begins to be a little bit more contempl- or he, he begins to contemplate even more in his own heart that as he sees this reality, as he gets to this kind of final portion, as he's 
search wisdom and pleasure and wise living and even toil and, and seeing all of that. He goes to verse 20 and he comes to this conclusion of sorts that the only way that he can kind of respond is that he turns about and gave his heart up to despair over all the toil of my laborers under the sun. I would say there, there is some good news even in that statement there, and we, we'll get to there later. But our response to the life under the sun is quite important. I think this is where, when we first started this series, we looked at a, some various common ways in which people may respond in the light of this reality that the preacher is painting for us, that we've just been looking at, of the vanity of it all. Some common responses may be, the nihilist who sees no goal in life or meaning in life, and so simply goes about all of life as despair. Everything is worth simply weeping over. All is despair. That's one response the world may respond to as we come to these truths before us. Another one might be a cynic, which I would maybe call the optimistic nihilist or the fun-loving nihilist. Uh, this is the guy that we might say is, is, is you know, I, I, I hate to do hashtags, but yo, hashtag YOLO, right? He sees no goal like the nihilist. It's full of despair, but might as well live it up while, we, while, while we're here, right? You only live once. Or another response might be the hedonist who does see a goal, and that goal is for one to achieve one's pleasure and desires, and so they indulge. Another common response to life under the sun is escapism or the escape artist, which maybe even in the sense of a lot of Christians may fall into a sort of a spiritual escape artist where we almost even romanticize or distract ourselves from the actual vanity before us under the sun. Whether that means that you tune out during a sermon like in a series like Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Not calling out anyone here. No one would do that here. <laughs> um, whether that be turning off the news when it gets too difficult. Whether that means you pick your news sources or your newspaper, no one gets newspapers anymore, your e-newspaper. Um, you, you pick your sources because it's not as depressing as the other ones. Or for even ourselves, we quickly jump from this reality of the misery under the sun that the preacher is painting for us. And rather than going deeper into that reality, it leaves us uncomfortable and we quickly jump to, it's gonna be all right. It's what my seminary professors used to call the Jesus juke, if for football fans here, where you just kind of somehow get connected to Jesus here, you kind of, there's this quick thing, or, or the Jesus syrup, if you like pancakes or waffles. But the preacher, what he wants to, for us to do here is not to just simply learn from his life, that's part of it, but it's that we would sit and see things as they really are. To not escape from them. And I'll say this, the gospel is not given to us as some sort of escape route. I think we see that very clearly from Christ's incarnation and just his life and death and resurrection. But there is an uncomfortable reorienting wisdom that the preacher wants for us here. And that's where we get back to verse 20 here. We see the preacher, as he sees all these things laid out before him, he comes to one conclusion. And one conclusion alone, that seems like the only conclusion that you can truly reach after canvassing the whole land under the sun and having everything at your exposal and, and, and searching in, in various places in every corner of the world under the sun of, of various places that you might be able to find gain, he turns about and gave his heart up to despair, a sort of hopelessness as he looks to the end. It's almost as if he is coming to his senses. that this is the proper response to life under the sun. And if there is only life under the sun. 
he goes on to explain a little bit more about why he despairs. In verse 21, he says, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom, he's a wise man, with knowledge and skill, must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. It's not just that it will be ripped from your hands, but everything you worked for will be given to the one, and sometimes it will be given to the one who did not work a lick for it. How upsetting is that? For a lot of us here in this room, pride ourselves in hard work. And work, once again, is wonderful. If you're a person who is geared to work hard, that's great. The preacher is not saying here to, to, to forego work. I don't want anyone to go back into the office tomorrow and say, well, it's all vanity, therefore I'm not going to do any work. That's not what the preacher's getting at here. He's once again talking about where we find and where we look for, for our gain, for, for advantage, for meaning, for significance, for our satisfaction, for our security. Where do we find these things? And he's saying that there is nowhere under the sun for this. And he looks at his work, all the hard work, and, and it seems like it's showing the results, right? Because as he puts his work or as he puts his hands to work with wisdom and knowledge and skill, there is something to be enjoyed, but it will just simply be left. It'll be gone. It won't last. It will not even save you from death's knocking at your door. All your hard work and striving. And he says, this is vanity and a great evil, or it can be translated there, a great burden. If you feel burdened right now by this sermon, that's exactly where we're supposed to feel. feel burdened by this reality. And he goes on then to ask a question that's kind of like the same question in chapter one, but spoken in a different light, and he expands on this. It's not just that we toil with our physical labors, that itself is exhausting and it's frustrating and it's full of anxiety, but he also talks about the striving of the heart, meaning it takes our whole person, our mental capacities, And he says, what has a man from all the toil and striving of heart, which which he toils beneath the sun? And if you're like me, you would hope in the next answer to this question that there would be something like, well, sometimes there's some joy to be had. But no, that's not his answer. He says in verse 23, for all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. That itself is pretty bad. And you might think, well, maybe there's some hope at night when I get to lay in bed, get to recharge. And he says, even in the night, his heart does not rest. What frustrations and anxieties this week or even this month or the season of life you're in plague your heads and your hearts in the mornings and evenings. What are you anxiously toiling over, consumed by, frustrated by, that keeps you up at night and keeps you in despair in the mornings when you are going about your day? That's a question that the preacher wants you to ask. And he says, this also is vanity. But in that statement and the continued statements throughout this chapter, that all this is vanity, this is also vanity, this is also vanity, I hope you're seeing that repetition there. There is great wisdom to be had there because he begins to kind of flip the switch a little bit when we get to the end here, and he kind of gets his concluding statements in the last verses of this chapter in verse 24. It's not like the light is just suddenly breaking through brilliantly, but throughout Ecclesiastes, it's not just a book about vanity under the sun or striving after wind alone. That's a lot of it. But there's another flip to the coin 
It's about what true joy is. What the preacher gets to at the end here is yes, everything under the sun is a striving after wind. It is all vanity if you were to place your life there. But he also gives us this wonderful hope that's not, it, that's not fully just there for us to just simply like say, like, these, these are the verses I'm gonna go and get printed off and, and hang it in my, in, in, you know, in, my, uh, in my home and these will be the encouraging verses that when people walk in. I also like to think that if the preacher here were to write a uh, New York's best time seller called The Best Life Now, um, it would be very different than what you might find on the shelves today. But what we get here in verse 24 to 26 is the first of some passages we're gonna explore as we go through this series. And I like to call them the enjoyment passages. This is the flip side to that coin of vanity that the preacher is saying and speaking of. Right, Ecclesiastes as the book of vanity, as many people have spoken, is just simply half the story because there's true wisdom to be found in the exploration that the preacher has for us here. Because he is saying that your joy is not gonna simply be coming from the end of the tunnel, right? Because when we're working, and as we think of work no longer as a gift, but as gain, we use work in such a way in which we are no longer placed here presently, here and now, and we're always looking to the future, right? So if I were to say this, if your station, if your season in life And what you are in right now with all of his frustrations and anxieties until the time that Christ returns or calls you home does not change. This is your lot. This is your portion of life right now of what you've been given. Could you earnestly say, my joy is complete in Christ. Could you say you have joy. If I'm being very honest, and I hope I'm not the only one here, the answer would be no. We're always looking for the next promotion. We say, when that happens, when that happens, at the end of that tunnel, comes my joy. We're looking to be a little bit more secure in our finances. When that happens, when my bank account is looking a little bit more like it's in the black right now, uh, that's when joy will finally come. When my kids are finally out of the house, (laughs) when my kids actually make it to college or whatever in their careers, marriage is mended, relationships formed, the list goes on of the various hopes that we have, and we toil and toil and toil, thinking that it will satisfy us. And the preacher says, that is vanity. That is striving after wind. That is a question for us to ask ourselves, to identify where are we putting our ultimate trust and hope? Because here's the thing that the preacher says, that in the midst of this, in the midst of the misery of desolate Eden, in the midst of where nothing is to be gained under the sun, joy is not gonna merely come at the end of that tunnel that you work so hard for. There is joy presently right now to be received. There is nothing better for a person, verse 24, than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This is the reorienting wisdom that the preacher offers us here this morning. It's that your life in God's world is not for gain and not for you to seek out gain, but is gift. Everything. Your portion in life right now your lot in life, because this is what the preacher says. He says that this also, he sees that this is also from the hand of God. 
Not just the really wonderful aspects of the lot or portion of your life right now, every single aspect of it right now, November 13th, 2022. I hope I, hope I got the date right. <laughs> right now, right now is the place, or is, right now is a time for you to receive the joy that is to be had. Not future. There is joy to be had now. Where is the place for this joy? Where you are right now. We hear in James, right? Count it all joy. Doesn't say count it all joy when life gets a little bit better for you. To the suffering Christians there. It's kind of no joy, even in the midst of various trials and tribulations. The preacher's summarized conclusion is a call to enjoy God's gifts as gifts. Gifts are received. We're not entitled to them. If we were here this morning, I understand that this may be easier said than done. And this is why it's such a simple application to speak of, but a harder one to really drive home into our hearts. But if you're feeling dissatisfied with a lot or portion of your life this morning, there may be a chance that you have placed what God has graciously given as gift and you have sought to utilize it as gain. You're asking for the gift to do what it was never intended to do. And will come up short every time. Zach Eswine, I'm quoting twice here this morning. There's one that will be in page three of your bulletins, but this one is not. He writes this, that the preacher here takes our eyes off of all of the miserable circumstances under the sun and asks us to look instead at our lot or portion, the fact that the life of every human being consists mainly in this, We've been given a place to be, some things to do, a need for sustenance, and a people to share this with. God originates these gifts. God is present with his gifts. Do you see, as the preacher is talking about this coming from the hand of God, that apart from him, who could actually eat? It's not just the gifts that are given, but it's also the enjoyment of the gifts that he gives. In all of this, what he is saying that in desolate Eden, not on the other side of the tracks, not when we get through the tunnel of life, not when we've just simply strived enough, he's saying right now in this midst of the mess that is made of Eden, where we are presently, there God is present with us. If we remember in chapter one, verse 13, the preacher highlights that God gives us the unhappy business of life here under the sun. And in conclusion here, he gives us that other flip side as well. The God who is sovereign, the one who's beyond the sun, he is not distant. He is not half-heartedly a giving God. He is not disinterested here now that things have gone a mess. He is present, and the fact that there are these gifts that are being given from his hand is almost this apologetic approach there's a reasoning of the fact that God is present here and now. People of God, hear this from the preacher. In your current lot and portion, God is present. He has not left you alone in the mess of what this garden has become. So Zach Eswine, this is on page three, if you wanted to follow here, he writes this again. The preacher reorients us. This is the, really the big application point for us this morning. To taste the sweetness of ordinary joys, we learn to enter each day with a conviction about the givenness of all things. The givenness of all things. The Western idea that we should seize a day would change from get out there, assert yourself, make, or take it, make it happen, to something more like this. Open your hands, pay attention to what God is giving, what he is not. Receive with humility what he gives as enough. Thankfully pursue this, enjoy this. 
not this wonderful bow that maybe we want this morning, especially when you look at the lot and portion you have. But that's the very thing that the preacher here is now orienting us with in the fact of where he comes to his despair and the hating of his toil and the reality of the vanity under the sun. Because then he goes on to speak in verse 26 of really two types of folks or people, whichever term you like better. I like folks. Two types of folks here. The first is this, is the one who pleases God. And the second is the sinner. I think this gives a wonderful example of this perspective of sin before God. We could maybe answer sin in the wonderful way that the shorter catechism answers that, but the preacher gives us a di- sort of a different answer here of two types of folks. The one who pleases God is this, the one who acknowledges God's sovereignty and this person receives with thanksgiving from God's hand that gives. His lot He has it, he has a portion, and he sees it as gift from God's gracious hand, knowing that God is also actively present there in his giving. He's not like our Amazon drivers who we don't know. He himself delivers from his very hand. I had had a a lot of Amazon packages this week. (laughs) Um, The sinner is just the opposite of this. This person also has a portion in Lot, but does not see God in it. And looks at his portion and Lot as something to be utilized and is striving to find for himself only what God can provide and give. David Gibson writes that it's so striking that now at the end of the preacher's epic quest through life or happiness, he discovers where it comes from, not from his striving, but from God's giving. And this leads us then to go even further than where the preacher is at here and where we will continue on. And there will be more times that we do talk about work and labor and toil in Ecclesiastes. I cannot wait. It was a joke, but I can't wait. <laughs> um, but there is hope that comes from beyond the sun. Because it would be quite saddening to say that, yes, that comes from God's hand, but is, is that just the continued cycle of what's gonna happen? Well, I wanna point us to the promise that God gives us in Isaiah 65. He gives us a promise from beyond the sun, the God who is above the sun and beyond the sun. And he gives us this promise that this desolate Eden will not be forever there is a new heavens and a new earth coming. And he writes this, where, where, where the labor will not be in vain. And he writes this in Isaiah 65 as this prophecy of this new heavens and new earth to come, where, where work itself is no longer simply toil that leads to nothing. But he writes this, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain. That day is coming. But until that day comes, we, like the writer of Lamentations writes in chapter three, verse 24, we are to say, the Lord is my portion. Do you see the things that the Lord has gifted you with? Those temporary things must lead us to the one who is our true portion, the one who actually gives and not just place our hopes in the things given to us here temporarily. And the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, the writer in Lamentations writes, I will hope in him. And more than this, we think, and go to the New Testament, what has God truly given? He's given us so much more than just simply eat and drink and find enjoyment under the sun here. He also has given us an accomplished work under the sun that will last forever through the ministry of Christ. We read this in 1 Corinthians 15, which is the wonderful Pauline chapter on the resurrection of Jesus. But when you get to the end of that chapter, he gives this exhortation to Christians, right? He just goes on and on about the wonders of Christ's resurrection, the need for it. And then he writes this, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 
knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, all that is done for Christ and in Christ shall not be lost. There is a work that will last. There is a work that can be accomplished and have the lasting significance, bring satisfaction, bring security, but it is not your work. We rest in the work of the Son, of Christ, of what he has done, in doing so, he redeems our work as we seek to use our work for his glory. Whether you eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. Enjoy these gifts as gifts. That pleases God. And if there's any doubt in you this morning, how can we trust such a God? We go to places like Romans 8. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? These are wonderful truths for us to cling to as we await for Christ to come again, to bring us home, to make an end to the vanity under the sun. That day is coming. To that day comes, we hear what the preacher says here. Living by faith in, in regards to what the preacher says here is as simple as this. Living each day, giving thanks to God for the gifts he's given us as gifts. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the application that's it. Simple. Maybe not as hard hitting as you wanted it. We still got a long ways to go in here in Ecclesiastes. But this requires the Spirit's work in our lives. Because if you're like me, it is hard to consider God's gifts as gifts and his gifts as truly enough for me. And this is where we look to the wonderful gift of him giving his son for us. We rest in that. We ask God to help us understand that. Maybe for some of us, it's gonna be going to the Lord, even in a period of repentance of saying, God, help me to trust you in the lot and portion you've given me. Because it's here right now, in this time, in your lot, in your place, where God is reminding us that he is Emmanuel, God with us. And Christmas is coming. <laughs> but with that, let us enjoy the gifts that God gives, for he is the great giver of life, and all great things flow from him. Please pray with me. Holy Father, we thank you for your word, this reorienting wisdom that we often need. We thank you for revealing to us even the vanity of life under the sun, of searching for things, the, the things that you've given as gifts to, to satisfy our souls, to save us. And yet, Lord, we know that they never will. And Lord, we thank you that you reveal that truth to us so that we no longer simply look at the work of our hands or even navel gaze, but Lord, that we come to you in need of your mercy. And Lord, we thank you that you, the God who is above the sun, has not left us in this mess to our own devices. For Lord, it's only from you where we can find true salvation and freedom and redemption, and that is through your son and his finished and accomplished work. Let us rest in that, and we can rest in that. So Lord, we thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.